the number of coronavirus cases is now rising sharply with the highest rate since May. England's senior medical advisers say we must take the virus seriously again. We've got a little too relaxed. In Scotland, fresh lockdown measures have been reimposed of people in the Glasgow area until they cannot visit other households. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, joins us now from Edinburgh. Good, Good morning. morning to you, First Minister. Good morning. Good morning. At the moment, people are encouraged to get back to work. Mm. Are you finding that that is happening in Scotland? Are people heeding that message? Because you, might I say, have been a little bit more cautious than uh, particularly England during the coronavirus crisis. Well, we're still being very cautious and our advice in Scotland is if you can work from home, then you should still be working from home. We are not encouraging people uh, to, to rush back to the office, uh, notwithstanding the, the benefits of having people back in the office to the high streets and, and businesses. Uh, but we think that it's really important not to overload ourselves so that keeping the virus under control becomes much more difficult. Our priority over the past couple of months has been to get schools back full time and then to keep schools open. And that depends on keeping community transmission of the virus as low as possible. So to put it simply, uh, while we would all like to go back to normal completely, we, we simply can't do everything right now. We've it's got a, to make it's a huge choices debate, and we've got to be very clear it? what our priorities it's are. It's a huge debate at the moment about the con economic consequences of people not being back in the office yep. and trying to stay safe. And it does seem that you've taken a very different angle on that from the government at Westminster? I'm just trying to strike the balance as, uh, as well as I can. It's, it's not, uh, unfortunately, a perfect science and, you know, there's not an absolutely right and absolutely wrong way to do this. Uh, I am acutely aware of the economic implications of everything we're doing to try to tackle COVID, but I'm also acutely aware that if we lose the battle uh, to keep COVID under control, then that's not good for the economy because we end up going back the way and having to put parts of our economy back into law. Lockdown. So getting this balance right is really, really difficult. It's very challenging, but it remains really important that we try to do that. What so, I, what you know, I think, people uh, are working, people are working from home, but getting everybody back into the office right now with schools also open, I think would tip us uh, back into the wrong place and actually set us backwards. I think what's been commendable about your leadership, if I may say so, is that you're out there every day you're talking in a very serious and detailed way about the situation in Scotland. We barely see uh, Boris Johnson down here ever. We don't have any of them on our programme, certainly informing our viewers about anything. They've banned us now for 133 days. But I do think that the way that you come out centre stage every day and uh, inform people has been really important. And, I, you know, what do you think of the way that the leaders down here have been conducting this crisis? They have no press conferences now. We don't see any of them other when they pop up occasionally in sort of, you know, cosy interviews with preferred journalists. Uh, look, every leader has to make uh, his or her own decisions about how they conduct themselves and how they decide to approach this. And I can only speak for myself. I think in a situation as serious as the one we've been living through, as uncertain and unpredictable, it's really important to be out there front and centre trying to explain to people the decisions that were taken, very difficult decisions that have a big impact on people's lives. And also trying to communicate, which is a really difficult thing for politicians, including me, to do, is communicate that sense of uncertainty. Uh, we don't have all of the answers and that's been true all of the way through. This is a virus that we uh, have had to learn about, we are still learning about, we've had to change approach in, in some circumstances and that is really difficult and I don't think there is a, a substitute uh, for just getting up there before people, uh, trying to explain that uh, as best we can and, and being How accountable concerned. and under scrutiny for that and that includes coming on to, to programmes like this which uh, I'm sure uh, some of us sometimes would prefer not to have to do but it's part of the responsibility we have. Well I think, I think it is a duty to the viewers actually, I mean that they are people who yeah, are, so are the electorate. Um, let me ask you a bit. This is obviously, it appears to be, a fairly critical moment in this crisis. We had the appalling first wave, which reached a crescendo through March, April, and was devastating to so many families mm. and lives and, of course, the economy as well. Last couple of days, the infection rates 
appear to be worrying, and certainly worrying enough for people like Professor Van Tam and the Health Secretary and others coming out now and really giving some quite stark warnings. We're also seeing, in countries like France in particular, a massive surge in cases and now an increase in the number of positive cases as a percentage, but more importantly and more worryingly, I think, an increase in the number of people in intensive care uh, in France as a result of this surge. How concerned are you that we may be three, four weeks behind what we're seeing in France, Spain and other countries? We've got to be concerned about that and we... I think we'd be failing in our duty if, if we didn't look to countries like France, Spain as well right now and say, is that what lies ahead of us and, and how do we do everything in our power to try to stop uh, going in that direction. You can have semantic debates right now about whether we are heading to a second wave or whether this is a resurgence of the first wave as, as we come out of lockdown. Remember, in lockdown, as we locked ourselves down, we locked the virus down. So as we come out of lockdown, we let the virus uh, loose too. So we have to do other things to keep it under control. One of the, the positive things right now, but it is really important we don't allow this to lead to complacency, is that the sharp rise in cases we're seeing, we're seeing that in Scotland as well, in numbers of cases and the rate of positivity. Maybe not quite as sharp as we've seen in England in the last couple of days, but certainly there and pronounced. That's not so far being matched by an increase in people in hospital or intensive care and, and certainly, thankfully, not being matched in the numbers of people dying. Now, scientists, I think, are a bit perplexed about that. The best explanation is because uh, it's more young people that are being infected right now. They're perhaps interacting more. But we shouldn't be complacent about that. As you say, we, we start to see these indicators increase in countries like France. But it stands to reason, if you allow transmission to become uh, really established in the younger, healthier parts of the population, that might stave off these uh, other indicators for a while. But yeah. sooner or later, How the risk is How transmission unhelpful gets is into the more vulnerable parts of the population. Right, and I think you fit the nail on the head there. It is young people predominantly getting infected at the moment because they're mm. basically getting on with their lives as they did before all this. And many of mm. them, I know, you know, including one of my sons, um, they'd look at the numbers, look at the stats and go, this is a problem for old people and sick and vulnerable people. We should be allowed to get on with our lives. Um, that attitude, I don't think is being helped when you see two England football stars uh, being sent home from an international uh, game because they sneak a couple of girls into the hotel room when they're supposed to be abiding by these very strict COVID rules, which is the only way we can play sport at the moment. Mm. What is your reaction to that? And what is your message to young people who may be looking at these two footballers and think, what well, if, if they're going to ignore the rules, why should we bother? Yeah. Look, I think footballers who are role models have to accept that responsibility. I've not been following the, the situation with the England players eh, all that closely, but we had a, a few weeks ago some similar situations in Scotland with some Aberdeen football club players going out to the pub on a Saturday night. Uh, we had a, a case of a Celtic player going eh, off eh, to, to Spain, coming back without quarantining. Eh, so, you know, footballers are, are role models for a reason. They're, they're talented people. Young people look up to them and they've got to, to take that responsibility seriously. Seriously. I mean, I understand how young people feel. I, I recognise what you've described there. I've got young relatives of my own. Um, but I'd say a couple of things to young people. Firstly, although it is far less likely if you get COVID that you will become seriously ill, it's not impossible. Uh, you know, there, there's, the chances of that are not zero. We also know that there are a number of people who never go to hospital or intensive care but have long-term or seem to have long-term health complications from COVID, the so-called COVID long haulers. But perhaps the more fundamental point is that if, if you're a young person getting your life back to normal, which everybody understands the, the desire to do, and you get COVID, you may not be at risk of ending up in intensive care, but you could be putting yeah. older relatives at risk. To yeah. be blunt about it, you could be infecting your, your granny or your, your granddad. Well, Hancock, so yeah, we've Matt all Hancock got to remember our responsibility yesterday. to others. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any concerns about, you know, it, you've got, it, you've got popular point. universities there in Scotland, which attract a lot of people from outside of the nation. Are you worried about them reopening next week? Yeah. People keep asking me, am I worried about X, Y, or Z? I, I, I'm worried about all of this just now. We're in a global pandemic of an infectious virus. For somebody like me not to worry about these things, I wouldn't be doing my job properly. But 
it's not enough to worry about, though we have to try to put in place the, the mitigating measures. We've got very detailed uh, and comprehensive guidance in place for universities and colleges. The sector, I think, is taking its responsibilities very seriously. But yes, the, the return of universities is another uh, situation over the coming weeks that make this situation very fragile. And I come back to this overall point. You know, at an earlier stage in the pandemic, we often talked about the headroom we had within the R number. Um, and that becomes more relevant now. We can't do everything uh, that we might want to do. We have to make choices. I think getting young people, uh, school age young people and uh, students back to education as normally as possible has to be a priority. Absolutely but right. the rest of us will have to continue to make some sacrifice, sacrifices yeah. to make that possible. That's the hard reality of the situation it that is. we're living through. And we just have to be sensible and we have to be cautious. And that's not about scaremongering people. It's about the bleeding obvious. Um, first, Minister, before we let you go, um, one of the benefits that you've experienced politically from your leadership through this, which I think has been commendable, I'm going to say it again, and I wish that we saw more of Boris Johnson right now, I've got to be honest, um, but one of the benefits for you has been a rise in support for Scottish independence. Mm. Now, we know that technically the UK government is insisting that there has to be uh, their permission for a legally binding referendum, but there are, there's a growing noise emanating from Scotland that if this support continues to increase, that you should be allowed to have another referendum it, during this parliament. Do you, do you support that? Do you think there should be? Uh, I think it's a basic statement of democracy that if there is uh, support in Scotland for another referendum, uh, there should be the ability to have another referendum because to deny that would be to deny the people of Scotland the right to have their democratic say. You know, my, my views on this are pretty clear. There is a Scottish election in May next year, of course, and uh, I will argue the case there for people to have that right to choose, and I'll make the case for independence. You know, genuinely, my focus right now is on tackling COVID, and, and, and that will remain the case for as long as we're in this situation. But, you know, I, I do think it is, it is the case that People in Scotland, uh, many people in Scotland, perhaps a majority of people in Scotland now, look at Boris Johnson and his government, the direction they're taking the UK in, and think that's not what we want for Scotland. We want to have the opportunity to uh, decide on an alternative path, a, a better path for our country, and that is the stuff of democratic okay. debate. The only people that should uh, be able to decide Scotland's future are people who live here in Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you.